Uh, hello and good afternoon, everybody, for, for uh, this week's uh, Infosys Chandrasekhar and Random Geometry Colloquium. Today, we're extremely glad to have Anirvan Basak from ICTS Bangalore. Amongst us, to, uh, would give us a talk on spectral properties of uh, spectral property okay, so random of random perturbations. <laughs> so it's non -sulfide. See, I found a type. <laughs> okay, up to you. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Shivajit. Okay. So let me begin. So I, I will speak about this uh, spectral properties of random partition of self-adjoint, non-self-adjoint operators. So let me, you know, begin with some motivations. So, you know, there are some uh, natural, you know, there are in, in many fields of science, there are, you know, there are natural occurrences of uh, non-self-adjoint operators. So, uh, you know, in the last 15 or 20 years or so, uh, so, there have been a lot of activities in partial differential equations to understand behaviors of uh, non self adjoint operators. So I just you know listed few a few. Uh, so for example, you know if you look at this, you know, Fock Planck uh, Fokker Planck type operators or Kramers Fokker Planck type operators or the PD solvability theory. So those kind of things have you know have gained a lot of attention in the last fifteen or twenty years in the PD side of uh, mathematics. And also you know in you know in you know in mathematical physics if you're looking to study quantum particles so uh, so in the context of scattering theory or if you're looking at open quantum system then there are also you know natural occurrences of non self adjoint operators and also on the applied side if you are you know working on working in fluid dynamics then it is natural to you know encounter non self adjoint operators there and also you may want to understand and 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 evolution driven by non self adjoint operators. So, so, so these are you know, just some examples of uh, non self adjoint op operators which uh, naturally occur in different uh, branches of science. So, so, you know, so, so, so if you look at the self adjoint operators, then uh, there, there is very well known uh, spectral theory which tells you that if you look at the norm of the resolvent of your self adjoint operator, then it is you know, well controlled and it is just given by the inverse of the distance of your spectral parameter Z from the spectrum of A. But in the context of non self adjoint operator, there is no such equality. I mean, so one can, you know, one can have different behaviors on the, uh, you know, on the growth of the norm of the resolvent. So let me explain in a slightly more detail. So let's say if you have a non self agent operator, and if you are looking at any Z, uh, which is outside the spectrum, then it can happen that the norm of the resolvent is of the same order of magnitude of the inverse of the distance of your spectral parameter Z from the spectrum. So this is known in the literature as the zone of spectral uh, stability. Or on the other hand, you can also have that this norm grows at a much faster rate than the, than the inverse of the distance of the spectral parameter Z from the spectrum of A. Okay, so let me try to know, illustrate this through uh, some very nice uh, and easy example. So let's consider one of the simplest non-trivial self uh, non-self adjoint operator, which is a left shift operator on CN. Okay, so you have so in the matrix form you have this Jordan block all its diagonal entries are zero and it's an upper triangular matrix where, uh, where you look, if you look at this position, which is just one of the diagonal, it contains all the ones. So this is a Jordan block. Uh, I guess all of us are very familiar, familiar with that. And if you look at the spectrum of this Jordan block, it just contains the singleton zero, okay? And you can check that if you take this Jordan block and if you take a Z, which is inside this open unit disk, then if you take this vector, which is one negative Z, Z square, all the way up to go to, uh, going to this negative Z to the N minus one, if you take this column vector, then if you look at that Z N minus Z times V, the L to norm of that, it is just absolute of Z or the modulus of Z raised to the N. So it just knows uh, because of this uh, precise structure of V, you get that this norm of Z N minus Z times V is exponentially small. Uh, for any Z which is inside the unit disk, which in turn uh, gives you the bound that, uh, that the, the norm of the resolvent is exponentially large in Z. So it grows exponentially in N in the, which is the dimension of the, of your operator. And so this happens for any Z inside the unit disk. So uh, we, uh, people call this as a zone of spectral instability. And on the other, uh, on the other hand, if you have Z which is outside the closed disk, 
then you can show easily that the norm of the resolvement is bounded is well behaved it is of order one which is basically roughly the distance uh, of uh, the inverse of the distance of z from the uh, boundary of the unit disk okay. any questions or comments at this point so if not let's go, let us continue so so you know so so maybe at this point it is not clear why do I call this uh, zone of spectral instability this uh, this open unit disk in the context of this left shift operator or the Jordan block? So again, this can be illustrated through an example, nice example. So again, we start with the shift operator on CN and we create a very tiny little perturbation delta. Okay. So you look at this matrix Z, uh, sorry J N delta, where we put where we take this J N that we start with and we uh, change the left uh, lower left corner. We change the zero to be delta. And you can check this, so it is an easy computation. You can check that the eigenvalues of this part of matrix J and delta are nothing but discrete uniform on a circle of radius delta to the one over N. Okay, so this means that, that if you choose your delta to be exponentially small in N, let's say you, you are taking your delta to be a uh, modulus of zero to the N for any Z in your open unit disk, then an exponentially small perturbation of Z N produces a, an eigenvalue which is of, dist of uh, distance modulus of Z from the spectrum of JN because the spectrum of JN contains only the zero, okay? And it also tells you that if, uh, that in that case, your delta is of order one, or if delta just polynomially decays in the dimension of your matrix, then, uh, the, then all the eigenvalues of JN delta would approach the unit circle as you let N go to infinity. Okay, so you see that you can create uh, an eigenvalue which is of distance order one from the, you know, the uh, from the spectrum of the unperturbed operator, and this this you can do by just you know adding a polynomial or even exponentially small perturbation. So because of this, you just you know uh, people call this zone as the zone of spectral instability because you can create eigenvalues which will be far from the spectrum of the unperturbed operators by just in you know, a very very tiny perturbation. Yeah, so this is just an illustration of that. And once you have this zone of spectral instability, this brings down or this brings up uh, this numerical or the rounding error. So again, let me you know uh, illustrate this some by uh, by a few fun experiments that you can do. So what you do, you start with let's say the Jordan block, and you ask your favorite mathematical software to simulate a hard unitary orthogonal matrix or dimension n. So let's call this U n. Okay, and then. What you do, you just conjugate your JN to the, with this UN. So basically, you multiply, you left multiply by UN and you right multiply by UN star, the complex conjugate transpose. Then we know that the spectrum does not change, but you ask your software anyway to compute the spectrum. And what you see is pretty interesting. So what you see is this picture that you see, that you see in the slide in the right hand side. So you start from the Jordan block. We know that uh, you know all its eigenvalues are zero. But when you do this conjugation by a hard unitary matrix, and you ask your, you know, ask your software to compute this, uh, compute the spectrum, it gives you this result. So it seems that all of the eigenvalues are now pushed towards the boundary of the unit circle. Okay, and this is not particular to this Jordan block. You can play with the matrix that you would like to, uh, you know, uh, work on, and this is true in much more generality. So for example, you can uh, take your Jordan block plus Jordan block square. And again, you conjugate on by UN uh, from the left and UN star on the right, then you get something which looks like this, okay? And this uh, shape has a name, it is called Limasson. Okay, so this is this shape. So, and the shape is nothing but, if you look at this, if you take this function A lambda to be lambda plus lambda square, it is just image of the unit circle. So this is the Limasson. And so these two examples that I gave you, this Jordan block and Jordan block plus its square, they are examples of Toeplitz matrices. So what you see here that, uh, you know, that this conjugation by unitary hard unitary matrix, and then asking your um, mathematical software to compute eigenvalues, push the uh, eigenvalues away from the matrix that you started with. And you can do more, uh, more, more such examples. For example, now I, uh, do a slight change in my matrix. So I again start with this Jane, which is a Jordan block. Now I add some diagonal matrix, okay? 
Now the diagonal matrix has the entries, which is linearly interpolating between negative two to a two. two. So I start from negative two, and I, as I go along the diagonal, I increase uh, my entries of order by order one over n, and I end up with the two at the very uh, bottom entry, bottom right entry, entry of my diagonal matrix. And again, you do the uh, same you know, computer, same task or same experiment. And again, you end up with something which, you, which looks like a stadium. Okay. So again, uh, so as I go along, I will explain. So this, okay, this example of matrix, which is JN plus DN for this particular diagonal matrix is an example of twisted triplets or which also goes by the name in the literature to with variable coefficients. And let me uh, finally show one more example. So here I'm starting again my Jordan block with JN, but I'm adding a different diagonal matrix. So here on the diagonal matrix, I'm adding, what I'm adding, uh, I'm putting ID uniform from, ne from negative two to two. Okay, and then I'm looking at the, uh, or then I'm asking my computer to simulate or to give me the eigenvalues of U N H and tilde plus uh, times U N star rather. Okay, and how to see is uh, something, uh, how to see here in the literature it is known as this Hathorne-Nelson bubble. So it seems that there is a bubble in which your eigenvalues stay or eigenvalues stick to. And this is what you basically say uh, going uh, in this picture. And this is an example of perturbation of non-periodic, which is not what is known in the literature, non-periodic one-way model. And this model is due to Brazil, Feinberg, and Z. So what they define, they define the periodic version of this, but here we're taking this uh, non-periodic model, meaning that we have this non-periodic boundary condition. And some of you may recognize that this model is basically a limit of Hathorne or Nielsen model. Okay. So basically, you know, through these four examples of these four experiments, what I'm trying, trying to convey is that, uh, that in case of non self adjoint operators, because of the spectral instability, you end up with producing, you know, a large numerical rounding error. And as an, you know, as an illustration of that phenomena, you see that uh, the eigenvalues of this, you know, this matrix where you're conjugating by U and U and star, you get something completely different. So now there is a, there is a uh, very well known literature in numerical analysis side of things that which tries to quantify this zone of spectral instability. So they are in the numerical analysis what people define, which is known as this pseudo spectrum. Okay. So given any epsilon positive, you can define what is called this epsilon pseudo spectrum of any given operator, which I denote by this spectrum with the subscript epsilon which is basically the union of the spectrum and the, all the Z in the resolvent set such that the norm of the resolvent is larger than epsilon inverse. Okay, so this is basically you are inflating the spectrum of your uh, operator. Okay, now there, you know, one can show that there, there are a few more equivalent definitions of say, epsilon pseudo spectrum. So you can also represent this epsilon pseudo spectrum as the union of all the spectrums that you can see if you perturb your matrix or your operator by another operator E, which has a small norm and the norm is bounded by epsilon. Okay, so these two definitions are actually one can show equivalent. And these two definition again is equal to the third one, which says the following, that any Z that you see in the epsilon pseudo spectrum that you can get either Z being the spectrum or for any given Z, there exists an approximate eigenvector to zero for this operator A shifted by Z. So all these three definitions are equivalent. So this has been first uh, introduced, introduced by in 17, 1979 by Vara and it, and it was popularized by Nick Trefethen. And so this definition I just took from a book by Nick Trefethen and Emery. Okay. And here are some pictures. So again, I'm going back to this Jordan block. And what you are seeing here is a, pseudo spectral level lines. So in this, you know, in this different concentric circles that you see here are the pseudo spectral level lines of your Jordan block of different magnitude. So I think the colors are given here. It is 10 to the negative 11 is the one that is the closest to zero and the lightest and 10 to the negative one is the pink one that is the most, that is in the most outside uh, of this picture. And, I, and as you see that, as your n increases, the pseudo spectral level lines are again pushed towards the unit circle. Okay. 
Now there are different, you know, different uh, applications of pseudo spectrum. So let me, you know, explain again. Uh, let me give you a couple of them. So there are, you know, there are problems in fluid mechanics when, when your, you know, problem is given by or there are some you know, non self agent operator appearing in your problem, and then the spectrum is contained in the left half plane. So then what you expect that in the long time that after, you know, that in the long time behavior that your dynamics dynamics would go to zero exponentially first. But what you see really there is that sometimes that the exponential of T of norm of A that has a big hump before it starts to decay. And this can be explained by the fact that in such situations, what happens is that, that the pseudo spectrum of A that would intersect on the right half plane of the complex plane. And because of that, uh, one see this phenomenon that there is a big hump before decaying this uh, this exponential t operator norm of a going to zero, and again in the in the literature this hump is related to the onset of turbulence, and as I said that the pseudo spectrum it explains the rounding of the numerical error, so there are several you know applications of pseudo spectrum, and in case of non self agent operators, so often what happens that the spectrum does not reveal any meaningful or good information and and the pseudo spectrum on the contrast reveals good information about the eigen uh, values as well as the eigen vectors of your uh, non self agent operator matrix anirban this uh, protrusion on the right uh, half plane there mm -hmm. have any epsilon greater than 0 or, or is there any cons uh, uh, so this i don't quite recall so i think uh, i think it should happen that in any epsilon should be greater than zero. So I think what, what you need to probably take that epsilon should be going to zero the dimension. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think in this kind of examples, what happens is that uh, the spectrum should, I mean, the, the pseudo spectrum should intersect to the right half plane for any epsilon greater than zero, which is, you know, so, so if epsilon increases, then you have larger and larger pseudo spectrum. I see. Right. So if it happens for tiny, uh, you know, for tiny epsilon positive, then I think you'll encounter this part in this problem. Okay. So, so, you know, there is a, uh, there is a, another analog of this in the context of Jordan blocks. So if you try to compute, let's say norm of, let me say, let me say this. So if you try to compute the norm of Z to the N, then what will happen is that I think that it will first increase and then to start to decrease. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of natural analog of this, uh, what you see, what people see in the fluid dynamics uh, side of things. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Okay, so no, so, as we uh, saw in the Jordan block example, that uh, that the that the pseudo level lines become kind of, kind of concentric circles uh, for different you know for different levels of its uh, for different values of epsilon. So you see a similar kind of scenario for the Limassol case as well. So you also see similar kind of concentric Limassol structure appearing as you see different pseudo level lines. And also interestingly, what you see on the right hand side is that. That you take this Jn plus Jn square plus you add a small noise, and and even in that scenario, what you see that the picture that you see over here it somehow looks like a, a Limassol again. So so in light of this and uh, people what people have done in the PD in you know in the PD side that they have tried to understand instead of instead of pseudo spectrum the random perturbation of uh, non self agent operators. So there is one motivation here in this picture that the pseudo spectral level lines kind of mimics what you see as if you are adding this random perturbation to your original or unperturbed non self agent operator. And in, on, on another side that there is no, you know, there is no um, general description which characterizes the pseudo spectral level lines for any general non self agent operator. So given these two scenarios or given these two, you know, uh, reasoning, what we will do is to, instead of trying to understand the pseudo spectrum, to try to understand what happens for the random uh, perturbations of non self adjoint operators. Okay. So now on, so from, so in this talk from now on, so instead of understanding the pseudo spectrum of a non self adjoint operator, we'll try to understand what happens to the spectral, 
you know, what is the spectrum of random perturbations of non self adjoint operators. Okay. So before I move on to the, you know, the topic of today's talk, uh, which is the random partition of non self adjoint triplets matrices, let me mention, there have been many, many works uh, in related areas, for example, uh, in the context of non self adjoint pseudo differential operators, both semi classical and non semi classical same, people have worked on this and they have tried to understand what is known as called as this probabilistic Wiles law or local eigenvalue statistics. So there are there have been work in, in the context of twisted to this matrices, or it's you know more general cousin which is known this known as this varies into this quantizations of smooth functions on torus. So there have been works on that, and then there have been a work of uh, myself with uh, Packet and Zytoni about this random viral matrix or this one way model, which I explained uh, earlier in this talk, which is, which as I said, is a kind of the limit of this Hartan or Nelson model. Okay. So in today's talk, I'll try to unravel what I'll try to explain is this, you know, the spectral behavior of uh, random perturbations of non self adjoint operators. So, so in this, you know, in this talk, I'll try to cover, you know, three, three, you know, broadly three different aspects of it. Uh, the first being the probabilistic while law or this asymptotic eigenvalue density. And the second one, which I'll try to, you know, uh, explain is this limit of point process induced by the outlier eigenvalue. So I'll explain what do you mean by outer, outlier eigenvalues as I go along. And then I will try to explain this localization of the delocalization properties of eigenvectors and see what we know and what we're trying to prove there. So, so this will be the uh, you know the uh, out kind of the outline of the remaining part of my talk. Okay. So first, let me uh, let me you know briefly you know uh, briefly formally define what do you mean by Toeplitz matrix. So Toeplitz matrix you can define given a you know given a sequence of complex numbers you can define a Toeplitz matrix out of it. So put constant a zero on the diagonal. You put a one along the first super diagonal, a two on the second super diagonal, and so on. And similarly, put a negative on the first a negative one on the first sub diagonal, a negative two on the second sub diagonal, and so on. Okay, so in this way, given any sequence of complex numbers, you can always construct a Toeplitz matrix out of that. Okay, and in this talk, I'll particularly focus on the case where Tn is finitely banded, meaning that there is a you know finite band outside which the mid entries are all zero. Okay, so there is some d1 and and d2 such that if your i is either greater than uh, strictly greater than D1 or strictly less than negative D2, then the AIs are zero. So there are results in the literature which deals with TN for general symbol, meaning that which, you know, uh, which does not have finite band structure, but I will focus for the purpose of this talk, I'll only focus on the case where have this finitely banded structure. Okay. Now, of course, given in TN, you can view it as a, you know, you know a finite dimensional version of an infinite dimensional operator. So I can construct the semi-infinite uh, operator and I can view as a finite section of that operator. So or formally you can say that your Tn is T times this projection to one to N and left multiply by the same projection operator. Okay. Now, again, uh, this is a one, another thing that you need to introduce this notion of definition. This is called a symbol of a Toeplitz matrix. So given as since we started from this bunch of, you know, complex numbers, from which you construct this Toeplitz matrix, so you can talk about a symbol of symbol associated with this matrix or this operator as well. So this is just this by infinite sum. So you so you have this a k lambda to the k k running from negative infinity to positive infinity. So this is called the symbol associated with this Toeplitz matrix. Now, in case your Toeplitz matrix uh, is a finitely bounded Toeplitz matrix, then what you're looking at is that. Well, our A is just a Lorentz polynomial. Instead of a bi-infinite series, just becomes a finite sum on both sides. Okay, so here are two types of T cap uppercase M. Okay, so let us go back to this uh, two examples that we started uh, this talk with. So we had this TN, which is the Jordan block, and you can check by this definition of the symbol, its symbol is just lambda. Okay. And similarly for the second example, which is the Jordan block plus its square, the symbol is just lambda plus lambda square. Okay. And so then, you know, and you can, so this, you know, gives an idea what is the symbol, uh, what does the symbol represent for a given Toeplitz matrix. Okay. So before I present uh, the, or in talk about the results, let me give you a couple more simulations. So again, I, I'm going back, going back to this example. So I have this Jordan block and the second one is Jordan block plus its square. So here, what you see in this simulation is that, so in 
uh, in red, so probably you cannot uh, very distinguishly see them. So in red, what you see is the eigenvalues of Tn plus a noise matrix. So, and what is the noise matrix? This is En divided by En, and En is a matrix with ID centered complex Gaussians. Okay. And in the orange, what you see is the, you know, this experiment that we talked about that, uh, that you are looking at the eigenvalues of UN, TN, UN stars. So, we're conjugating by a hard unitary matrix from the left and you're multiplying by its complex conjugate transpose on the right. And as you see, that these two red and the orange circles are very close to each other, both for the Jordan block case and for the Lima socket case as well. So as you see, as I said already a few times that this pseudo spectral level lines and this, you know, um, this random, uh, this arguments of the random part of, you know, of these operators are kind of close to each other, okay? So given this, uh, okay, before, before that, so let me again, you know, clarify what is the setup here. So we have this TN, which is again finitely banded and we will have this symbol A with uh, associated to it. And we take EN to be a random matrix. Let's say its entries are R of order one. And, and as a prototype example, you can consider that it has ID Gaussian entries, for example. So, so all the results that follow, for example, you can take your uh, entries to be ID standard complex Gaussian and all the results that I'm going to state will be true for that, for example. Okay. And how to do now we're looking at this TN, this sum TN plus N to the negative gamma times EN, where gamma is strictly greater than, greater than one half. And and this gamma greater than one of condition is necessary because you can show that the operator norm of En is of the order n to the one half. So to so for this guy to be really a noise matrix, you need the operator norm to go to zero. And therefore, you you know it is important to take that gamma uh, take gamma greater than one half. Otherwise, the result that I'm going to say would not be valid, and you will see completely different picture for that particular value of gamma. Any questions or comments? Okay, so let's continue. So now, uh, once you clear the setup, then you can, you know, then you can, you know, then you can formally state what are the questions that you're looking at or what are the kind of, what are the spectral features or the properties we are trying to understand. So the first thing that people try to understand the limit of the bulk of the eigenvalues, meaning that you define this empirical measure of the eigenvalues, which you put, uh, which you put mass one over n at each of the eigen, each of its eigenvalues, then you want to understand what happens as n goes to d infinity. So you want to understand the large gene behavior for this empirical measure of the eigenvalues of your matrix. Then you ask if this matrix, if this limit is universal. Now there are, there are, there are two kinds of universality you can ask, ask for. One is the, is it universal with respect to the distribution of the interest of EN and respect to gamma as well. So recall this gamma is a coupling constant which you are allowed to vary. So in our setup, we take, we can consider any gamma which is greater than one half. So it does not, I mean, so the result that I'm going to say is again, you know, uh, hold for all these choices of gamma. So as I said, you can ask whether, you know, this limit is universal with respect to either EN or respect to either gamma as well. And then you may want to understand how the limit, how does the limit depend on the symbol? Next, you can ask if there are outliers and what do you mean by outliers here? So as you see from these pictures, you know that there are some stray eigenvalues which are kind of away from the support of the limiting measure. And also this is true for this, this piece of the picture. So these eigenvalues which are you know, sitting away from the support of the limiting measure, those eigenvalues I'm calling them as, out, as outliers. So these are the stray eigenvalues which are away from the support of the limiting measure. So we can ask other outliers and as you see from simulation, yes, there are. And then you can ask if, if there are outliers, then what is the limit of the point process induced by these outliers? And again, you can ask whether or not these limits are universal or non-universal respect to gamma, respect to EN, et cetera. And finally, you can ask how does the eigenvectors look like? Are they localized or are they delocalized? Or do you expect some, to see some kind of quantum unicarioticity or not? So I'll, so I'll try to uh, you know, answer some of these questions in the remaining time that I have. So first let us start uh, about the result, about the limit of the bulk of the spectrum or limit of the empirical measure of the eigenvalues of this sum. So recall we're looking at this sum. So let me remind you, we're looking at this TN 
plus n to the negative gamma en and this gamma is greater than one half. So this is our setup. So this will tells you that, that if en satisfies some, uh, some assumption A, which I'll you know, uh, explain in a slide or two, then the empirical mean of the eigenvalues converges weakly in probability to the law of AU, where A is a symbol recall and U is any form measure on the unit circle. Or in other words, you can say that the limit is the push forward of the uniform measure on the unit circle by the symbol. Or in other words, if you give me any bounded uh, real world function defined on the complex plane, then if you're looking at the average of the, you know, the f of f at lambda i's, that converges to this integral. So this is so this is and this happens in probability as n goes to infinity. So this is what this result says. Okay. Sorry, so Arima, the limit is independent of gamma when gamma is more than half? Or? Yes, yes. So, so this is universal. So in that respect, this is universal respect to gamma. Hmm. And also, as you can see from the, you know, from this uh, statement that I did not impose any other condition on this EN, except for this assumption A, which I'm going to state in a moment. So it is also in that sense, this is also universal uh, with respect to the distribution that you put on EN. Okay. So now let me uh, explain how to, you know, again, by two examples that I have been, uh, that I have been talking about in the first case where, this, where you have this Jordan block, then the limit is just the uniform on the unit circle. And in the second case, case where you have this Jordan block plus its square, then the limit is just u plus u square, where again u is in form of the unit circle. So you know, so this is very specific limits that you will see for a Toeplitz matrix. Okay. So now let me mention what do, what what is this assumption A. So the first one is very you know is not very you know is not very uh, difficult to see in the sense that so it just requires that all the second moments are finite and the sum of all the second moment of all your entries are of order n squared. So if you start with a matrix uh, for which all the entries have, you know, finite bounded second moments, then you have the first condition to be satisfied. Now the second one is a bit more technical condition. So it says that for any matrix MN, whose, you know, whose operator norm does not grow too rapidly, then if you look at the smallest single level value of this MN plus CN, that cannot be too small. Okay, so this is a technical condition and there have been a lot of work in the last 15 or 20 years to understand uh, the behavior of the smallest singular value of a random matrix when we add a partition. So this goes by the name of smooth analysis of singular values. So for example, uh, this assumption A part two will be satisfied if you take any matrix EN with let's say uh, mean zero variance, uh, variance one ID entries. Okay, so again, so it says that this condition two, this part of this assumption A is not very rigid. So it allows for many, you know, many generic situations. Any questions or comments? All right. So now let us go to the, go to the, go to the description of the outliers. Okay. So here, what will assume that, you know, so just assume that these entries, sorry, these entries are independent with zero mean and unit variance. So do not require them to be, have the same distribution. Then again, for any gamma greater than one half with probability approaching one, there are regions which does not see any eigenvalues whatsoever. So there are no outliers outside the spectrum of the limiting to operator. And in this first example where you're to please, where your limiting operator is the left shift, left shift operator, then the spectrum one can check is this entire disk. So there are, as you see from the simulation, there are no eigenvalues outside this unit disk. And you can actually prove that, that there will be no eigenvalues probably going to one outside this unit disk. And same from the Lima saw case. So here one can again check that the spectrum of the limiting to please operator is just inside of this a uh, whole of Limassol. And as you can see from the simulation, and we can also so, uh, show in our theorem, for example, that there will be no eigenvalues outside the uh, Limassol as well. So this is a, you know, so this does not require a, you know, very little thing. Uh, uh, 
about the distribution of events. It just requires to be independent and zero mean and unit variance. Okay, and again, it is true for all gamma greater than one half. Now, once you understand that there are no zeros or no eigenvalues rather outside this uh, spectrum of the Toeplitz to operator, then you can ask what happens to the random point process induced by these eigenvalues inside these you know, domains. Okay, so here you need to assume something more. So here you need to assume that they have the same distributions, and again you stick to this uh, stick to these two assumptions of zero mean and unit variance. And you need to assume that they satisfy some anti-concentration bound. So what do you mean by anti-concentration bound? So roughly it means that you can assume that, uh, you need to assume that they have bounded density, for example. Okay. Then for any gamma greater than one half, this point process has a limit induced by the outlier eigenvalues as a limit. And it converts to the zero set of some non-universal random analytic function. So this random analytic function that you get here depends on the distribution of the entries of your noise matrix, okay? And let me, so the, so the description is not very, you know, not very um, easy to uh, explain the description of the limiting random analytic function. So definition requires some uh, notions about the skew semi-standard semi Young tableau, so which I'm not going to go there in, uh, you know, during the talk, but I'm, well, I'll be happy to discuss about it after the talk, okay? So let me again, again, go back to these examples that have been talking for many times. So if we go back to this first example of this Jordan block, then the limit has a nice de description. So the limit, the limiting random function, in this case, inside a disk will be this hyperbolic Gaussian analytic function, which has this explicit form. So the, uh, so the random point process induced by the outlier eigenvalues, which are inside this unit disk for the Jordan blocks case, converts to the zero set of this Gaussian uh, hyperbolic analytic function and this GL uh, or SID standard complex Gaussian. Now to describe this limiting random analytic function in a slightly more general setting, which is let's say the example two I have been talking about, this Limasa requires some more notation. Yeah, and, and you'll see that one can generalize it, but it, it becomes a bit ugly to describe during the talk. Okay. So let me try to explain what happens for this Second example, what happens for this limiting random analytic function that you get as a limit of this random point process induced by the outlier eigenvalues. Okay. So what, what, uh, what I've drawn here is that decomposition of the complex plane into three different region, uh, regions, white, gray, and black. The white, reg white region, I'm calling it to be R0, black, I'm calling it to be R2, and the gray, I'm calling it to be R1. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see immediately that, that the region R0 has zero winding number, R1 has one uh, has winding number one, and R2 has winding number two. And this is because of the fact that if you look at this symbol shifted by this Z, then it has two roots inside this R0, all the roots are greater than one. So zero is less than one. So the number of roots that are less than one is zero. Here there is one root that is less than one. And here, both the roots are less than one, okay? And this, and this description of the random uh, analytic function depends on which zone you are in, okay? So for example, if you are in the zone where the winding number is one, then the limited random analytic function looks similar to what we have seen in the Jordan block setting. Instead of Z to the L, you put Xi minus Z to the L. And what is this Xi minus? So the Xi plus minus are the roots of this quadratic equ equation to get from the symbol and the xi minus one uh, minus is the smallest one. Okay, so this looks something like this hyperbolic Gaussian analytic function, but it is not because instead of z you put the xi minus. And for uh, z, if you are in the region of winding number two, then it is then it gets more complicated. Then it is some linear combination which looks like this. Now you see that in this case, even if the noise is Gaussian, you get a uh, you know, you get random variables which are product of Gaussian. So the limiting random analytic function is no longer a Gaussian analytic function. And things get more and more complicated as the symbol gets, you know, more and more complicated. Any questions or comments? Okay. 
So now let us move to the uh, eigenvectors. So, so far I have not given you any pictures about this eigenvector. So this is what happens for the eigenvectors. So he, let me try to explain what, uh, what is in the picture. So, so do simulation for this random partition of the Jordan block plus a noise. Okay. Now here n is let's 1000. Now what you do, we plot the eigenvectors for gamma equal to two, which is the top left, this one. Here, this is, I'm decreasing, we are decreasing the value of gamma, gamma is 1.5 and here gamma is one. So you see that in these two examples of gamma greater than one, the eigenvectors has a nice decay. They decay sort of exponentially, but something strange start to happen at gamma equal to one. Okay, and if I continue, then you'll see that similar kind of behavior happens as you move, as you move your gamma below one, below the one threshold. So if your gamma is 0 0.9, then you see this picture, if your gamma is, 0.75, you see this one. And if you see gamma less than one half, then what you basically you'd see is the eigenvectors of a complex Gaussian matrix. And you see this is completely de delocalized and completely random. Okay. So this is what happens pictorially. So, you, so the simulations seem to suggest that there is a phase transition at gamma equal to one. And it seems that for gamma greater than one, the eigenvectors sh should decay exponentially. And below that, eigenvectors should have, you know, some delocalized behavior. So here is, uh, and again, let the, so I've included this picture to demonstrate that this is again, not, not specific to the Jordan block. It happens, it happens in much more generality. So for example, here, what you see is eigenvector for Jordan block plus its square. And, and, and even in that scenario, you see that this eigenvectors decay exponentially. So this eigenvector that is plotted in the left panel is corresponding to this eigenvalue here. Okay. And similarly, you can do for other eigenvalues uh, in the spectrum as well. Okay. So here is a result that we have been, uh, been able to prove about the localization of eigenvectors for gamma greater than one. Okay. So what you can show that for most eigenvectors, not for all, with probability approaching one as your dimension increases to infinity and you need to assume certain conditions on EN. So I'm not going to specify here. So we can show that there is a localization at scale N over log N. Meaning that if you look at the L2 norm of the vector of your eigenvector V from L to N. So if you, let me draw it here. So if you arrange your V1 to VN in this way, and if you look at the mass that is supported on from L to N, that is decreasing as a speed log n over N. So I'm taking this minimum here because depending on, on the winding number to positive or negative, your eigenvector should would be either localized on the left or localized on the right. So in the case where your eigenvectors are, uh, where your winding number is positive, your eigenvectors will be localized on the left. So then if you, in that case, if you look at the mass that is supported from L to N, that will decrease at a speed log N over N. So it means that if you take your L to be, sorry. So if you take your L to be some large constant times N over log N, then you already see that the mass that you get from that part of your vector is negligible. And on the second part, what we show that these eigenvectors also spread out at this scale n over log n. And what they mean by that, that if you define your support with slightly different in a slightly different way. So look at the, so define your cardinal to support to the minimum length of the, you know, of subsets of one through n you need to have a non-negligible mass or mass of order one for your vector. That length has to be of the order n over log n. Meaning that for any set which has cardinality size, uh, which has cardinality less than log n over log n cannot carry an order one mass of your eigenvector. So this basically tells you that this eigenvectors should spread out at this same scale n over log n. Any questions or comments? Okay, so now let me just briefly mention what we're trying to prove for this delocalization of the eigenvector. So this is a, a ongoing work with Martin Dolan of Azaitoni. So what we expect here 
to see some kind of long, long range correlation among its entries. And we expect some form of quantum unique ergodicity in this uh, scenario where you're looking at this eigenvectors for gamma less than one. But, but we are far from proving any of these two things. So this is still a work in progress with Martin and Offer. So in the next 10 minutes or so, let me try to you know, give you some very brief ideas about the proofs of these three uh, things that we've discussed. So here, so, so here is a very, you know- By the way, you can, uh, you have 15 more minutes because okay. we started okay. practice. Sure. So here is a very, you know, very high level idea of how to prove about the results about this asymptotic eigenvalue density or the outer limit laws or the local or the localization of the eigenvectors. Okay. So first what we do is take any Z, which is outside the image of the unit circle of the symbol. Since, you know, since an eigenvector, sorry, since an eigenvalue is a zero of the characteristic polynomial. So what we look at is the determinant of this, our matrix that we need to understand shifted by this Z. Then you break this determinant into sum of n plus one mini, which you call this dead sub kz quantities, which you call this dead sub kz. And what is this dead sub kz? Which are, these are the homogeneous polynomial degree k in the entries of n when you expand this determinant on the left hand side. So once you expand this determinant on the left hand side, you can see that you can, you know, combine terms which are which are homogeneous uh, polynomial degree k on the in the entries of n. Now, next step is the crucial step here. Next step, you need to identify this an index k star, which will depend on this winding number, such that this dead k star is the dominant term. So this dead k star should dominate the rest of the term. And for this, you need to find a lower bound on this dead k star, and also need to find an upper bound on the dead case for k not equal to k star. So to find an upper bound on this dead k, you need to do some comment analysis and counting argument to compute some high moments of these guys, of this dead K. And to find a lower bound on this dead K star, you need some anti-concentration bound, or in other words, you need some bounded density type, you know, assumption on your entries. So combining these two, you know, steps, you can, you can identify this dead K star, which will be the dominant term in this expan expansion. Now, once you identify the dominant term, the, you know, the rest of the argument is pretty simple for the asymptotic eigenvalue density, because now you have to just say that once you understand what is the order of magnitude of this dominant term dead case star, then it allows you to compute the limiting log determinant of your matrix, Tn plus n to the negative uh, uh, gamma En minus C. And once you understand this limiting value of this log determinant, that will give you the log potential of the limiting probability measure. And that's how you, you get this, uh, the, you, you derive what is the limit of this asymptotic eigenvalue, uh, sorry, you, you derive what is the limit of this empirical uh, measure of the eigenvalues. Now to, now to, you know, now to find what is the limit of these outliers or this uh, limit of the random point, point process induced by these outliers, you need to understand what is the limit induced by this dominant term, by the zeros of this dominant term. I think that needs some work, some more work, but similar lines of work. Uh, using that, once you understand what is the limit induced by the zeros of the dead case star, you can, uh, uh, you know, derive the limit for the outlier eigenvalues. So, so I'll not go into the details of this, but this is in rough. This is a this is a very rough idea of what is going on here. Now, for the eigenvectors, it needs a different uh, different technique and different kind of approach. So here, how do you do? So, so we pick with a good eigenvalue. As I said, that our eigenvector result holds for most eigenvectors. So we pick a good eigenvalue. Let's say its eigenvector is v sub z. Then as a first step, we need to show that there exists an approximating eigenvector, which you call this WZ. So it approximates your eigenvector, such that this WZ has a nice expression, nice or nice property. It belongs to the span of EJs, where this J run from one to mod absolute of DZ and so on. And what is this DZ is just the winding number. So it can be positive or negative, so you need to put the absolute value there. And these EJs are the singular vectors corresponding to this, the smallest singular values of Tn minus C. So you have this absolute value of dz many singular vectors corresponding to the absolute value of dz smallest singular uh, values of Tn minus C. So this requires some work. So once you show that, then that, then basically the you know the 
argument boils down to showing that this EJs decay exponentially. So what happens is here is the here is the interesting thing that this EJs they decay exponentially at speed one if your j is strictly less than this index. So it says that all but one singular vector decay exponentially fast with speed one, but the last one decays at speed which is log n over n, and this kind of captures the right speed of localization for your eigenvector. So from this step, you just get the upper bound. Now to lower bound, you need to work a little bit more. You need to show that this W Z has a non-negligible projection onto the subspace spanned by the last singular vector. And since the last singular vector decays at speed log n over n, you deduce from there that any subset which has currently less than log n over n cannot produce a mass order one. So combining these three ideas, you, you get this view of the localization of eigenvectors. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Let's uh, thank our speaker for this wonderful talk. Uh, okay, I think uh, we can take quite a few questions, actually, we have time left. So go ahead. I have a question. Yeah, let's go. Uh, so, so, uh, so in the case of a, a Gaussian a GUE uh, noise, could you say what the connection to a skew Young tableau is? Okay. So, let me go here. Uh, so, see, let's see. Okay. So, let me maybe go here. So, you know, so the basic step is the following here. Okay, so here I said, as I said, that we need to decompose this into this date k, but this date k is a kth, uh, sorry, date k is a homogeneous polynomial degree k in the entries of n. So if we expand what is this date k, it will come something like this. So your date k will be something like this. You will have this tn minus z, okay? Then you look at the sum x, sum y. So you're looking at the submatrix indexed by rows you know, rows in is by X and column index by Y and looking at the determinant of that. And you have the determinant of the noise matrix for the complement one, right? Mm -hmm. And then you sum over all X and Y, which has size K. Mm -hmm. You may have plus minus there, depending on the sign of this, you know, this permutations that you'll get. So, mm -hmm. so, so one intuition is that if you look at the determinant of a, you know, a minor of, of a Toeplitz matrix, that can be represented for certain X and Y by skew sure polynomials. Uh -huh. So this gives you the, you know, the, you know, give you the limiting random variables and this gives you this limiting coefficients, this kind of sums. So for, so for a fixed, so, so for a particular X and Y, you can, you can really represent this guy as the, uh, skew sure polynomials, but for general X and Y, you may not be able to do that. So therefore you just go back to this definition of the skew sure polynomial, which is, which you can write in this, you know, this uh, skew semi standard uh, young tableau using those representations. So basically this, you know, the skew semi standard young tableau that comes from this part of this sum. I see. So in the diagonal case, when the topids matrix is actually uh... Uh, a diagonalizable matrix. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it's a diagonal matrix. Then you, then there is a the standard, not the standard, but the the same correspondence that you see with uh, sums of Hermitian matrices. Do you see that? Yes, this? yes, yes, yes. So, so, so basically, this is these results are for non-self-adjoint uh, toplist. But if you have a self-adjoint toplist, then the you know, then the pseudo spectrum and the or also the just just they will be very close to the actual uh, spectrum of this toplist matrix. So this phenomenon that you will see only happens for the non-self-adjoint case. But let's say, uh, let's say you have this kind of toplism. Let's say zero, one, and one, for example, yeah. this kind of scenario. So you'll see that the that the that the random part of it does not change much to the spectrum of this unpart of this thing. So this kind of so this random part of it will kind of stick to the stick to a small neighborhood around the spectrum of the unpart of Toeplitz matrix. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, okay, if uh, there are no further questions, uh, let us thank our speaker again for this wonderful talk. And hope to see you in the next week again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.